The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at peerview.com forward slash CQB860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to our uh, Ash uh, Friday Sat Satellite Symposium. Uh, I think this is probably for many of us the first uh, program that we're, we're part of at this meeting, so it's great to uh, have you all here and join us. Uh, the title of this uh, symposium is, uh, as you see, Realizing the Promise of Novel Therapeutics in Non-Hodgkin Lymphoma. It's uh, entitled A Master Class in Tumor Board on Decision Making in Three of the More Common Lymphoma Subtypes. So we have a great uh, group of speakers today uh, who uh, tend not to hold back in what they say, so I think we're going to have a great discussion and interaction uh, for the next uh, uh, couple of hours. So uh, our panelists, I'm John Leonard from Wild Cornell Medicine in New York Presbyterian. We have Nathan Fowler, uh, Matthew Lunning, and Simon Rule, uh, who are going to cover uh, key topics uh, across the spectrum of uh, these B-cell malignancies. So I'm going to start with just a few uh, introductory comments, and then we'll get into the, the meat of the program. Uh, and uh, I think that we all know that uh, B-cell malignancies uh, have uh, a challenging spectrum of uh, presentations and issues that we deal with. Um, you see and know that uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma as a group is uh, the most common of the hematologic malignancies, and really there are more lymphomas than leukemias and myeloma combined in incidence. You see the numbers there on the right. Uh, and clearly these evolve from different cell types, different genetic mutations and conditions that lead to the characteristics that we confront in our clinic uh, every day. And I think uh, the exciting and complicated part of this is that we have so many uh, new treatment choices. And this is just a, a summary of the key ones you see uh, over the last uh, five to seven years, we've had uh, lenalidomide, idelalisib, ibrutinib, venetoclax, acalabrutinib, copenlisib, duvalisib, CAR T-cell therapy, a number of different combination studies in the bottom right just in the last year, as well as acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib. And when you think about this, this is really, I think, amazing, and it's great for patients. And you know, when I see patients in clinic and I tell them about, uh, particularly with indolent lymphomas, um, what their long-term outlook is, um, really we have no clue. Because when we say how many people live five years, 10 years, 20 years, it's with treatments that weren't even on this slide and now we use every day and are clearly impacting patients. So I think it's really important to keep in mind and obviously this makes our day-to-day -day life complicated because uh, we have to keep up with all of this and I'm sure that's why many of you are here trying to figure out uh, how we use these new therapies for the, the most uh, benefit for our patients. So what we're going to do uh, over the course of uh, the next uh, two hours or so, give or take, is to uh, cover first follicular lymphoma and some of the new data there moving beyond immunochemotherapy, looking at mantle cell lymphoma, which has uh, so many new drugs and options, uh, large cell lymphoma, which uh, is the most common lymphoma, and I would say there are probably less new positive developments there, but nonetheless, because it is so common and because it's a curable lymphoma, in many cases, uh, we obviously want to get that right uh, as well as we can. So just to give you a brief preview, we'll have a discussion of follicular lymphoma uh, from, from Nathan. Uh, he's going to present to us an older patient with symptomatic follicular lymphoma uh, who's had therapy before. We'll talk about uh, the patient's experience, the uh, options that the patient has, and how we weigh all that in our practice, which uh, remains a daunting and uh, complicated task. So we'll hear how Nathan and, and others uh, handle that. In mantle cell lymphoma, Simon will give us uh, some data on uh, the relapse setting. And relapse mantle cell lymphoma, pretty much uh, everyone is going to relapse with mantle cell eventually. And we have lots of new drugs, as we alluded to. So how do we best deploy them for our patients? And Simon will take us through that. And then Matt is going to talk to us about uh, a scenario of a patient refractory to RCHOP and where the majority of that group of patients that have relapsed or refractory disease are not going to do well. We've typically headed them toward transplant, but now we have other options for many patients, and so how we sort through all of those issues also uh, is an important practical question. So I think 
three timely scenarios, more or less, uh, in these common lymphoma subtypes, and I think it's going to lead us to a nice discussion and probably some differences of opinion as well, hopefully, um, that we can go around with uh, in the panel. So uh, with that, we're going to go straight to uh, the first talk. Nathan Fowler from uh, University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center is going to talk to us about uh, beyond immunochemotherapy in newly diagnosed and relapsed patients with a focus on the evidence. Nathan. Okay, thanks everybody, and um, thanks for getting up early to come to this. You can see they sent a picture of my son <laughs> as the, uh, how do I move forward? So we'll. Um, explore some of the chemo sparing treatments in follicular lymphoma. You know, a lot of us have been using uh, our chemo for a long time, and uh, so I'll just, you know, for full disclosures, I'll, I'll, I'll talk mainly about uh, kind of non-chemo, and I should say, when I say non-chemo, I mean non-cytotoxic uh, therapies in most of my talk. I'm going to start out with a, a patient, I changed the name, but this is a, a patient that I saw in clinic who uh, presented at age 70. Uh, this gentleman had symptomatic follicular lymphoma, had uh, essentially come in with uh, increased abdominal bloating, had uh, some uh, large lymph nodes, the largest one was around seven centimeters. Uh, he had a biopsy of a mesenteric node. It showed the CD10 positive, CD20 positive, BCL2 positive, a population of small cells, and was diagnosed with a grade two follicular lymphoma. Um, we talked to him. And uh, again, he had kind of a bulky disease in the abdomen. The PET scan showed low SUVs, but I felt that he would uh, benefit most from a, a chemotherapy backbone. So uh, after a lot of discussion, we decided to go with uh, CHOP chemotherapy. I should mention his heart was fine, good ejection fraction. And after that, uh, he had two years of rituximab maintenance. But as I mentioned, he was 70, and he did have a kind of a tough time. He developed neutropenia a couple different times during the therapy. I think he had never got admitted, but he did develop uh, a couple different infections, some sinus infections and uh, pneumonia that he did not have to get admitted for, but he did require antibiotics for a couple weeks. He also uh, was left with uh, some numbness and tingling, which is still present. Uh, and clearly he had alopecia, which eventually recovered. But uh, needless to say, when he was done with his chemo, he was uh, happy that he didn't have to come back and see me for a seventh cycle. He then went on to receive two years of rituximab maintenance. And uh, about two years after finishing maintenance, so now you know, that's, again, about four years out. He's in his mid-70s. Uh, he had progression of disease. So again, we're sitting in my clinic uh, for uh, a follow-up visit, and we talked about several of the options. I think one of the things that many of us would use uh, in practice these days would be something like bendamustine for a patient who progresses after our chop. And uh, he had brought up kind of his prior experience and was not too keen to get back on IV treatment like bendamustine. Uh, you know, he thought about his uh, febrile neutropenia, neuropathy, et cetera. So, uh, this was uh, not long uh, after we had seen some of the results of the AUGMENT trial, which uh, John was the PI for, and we talked about using R-squared. Uh, now, R-squared is lenalidomide and rituximab, and uh, we gave him this. He received uh, almost 12 cycles of treatment, achieved a good remission, and uh, is doing well. And I'll show you something has since happened. But uh, So some key points from his case so far. Um, as I mentioned to you uh, initially, uh, when he first presented, he did have symptoms, so uh, we decided to start therapy. There are several different options uh, of how to treat these kind of patients in the front line. Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, some data with R squared in the front line, but I think in the United States, the three most common regimens that most of these patients will receive if they're symptomatic would be RCVP, which is cytoxin, vincristine, prednisone, R chop or uh, bendamustine and rituximab. And the adverse event profile is similar and different between these uh, three regimens. Obviously, they all have alkylators in them, but uh, bendamustine, you don't see quite as much uh, alopecia and not as much neuropathy, but maybe a little more uh, nausea and vomiting. Rituximab maintenance uh, is something that uh, I would be interested to hear from the panel, how many people are using that. I think it depends on, I often joke with your, my patients that the use of bendamustine often depends on where you trained. 
If you came from a center that uh, did some of those trials, uh, you tend to do more of it. I think the Europeans tend to do a little bit more maintenance. And uh, at least in my practice, uh, I, I still kind of individualize the use of maintenance based upon how patients present and how they respond to uh, induction. I don't know, uh, Simon or Matt, do you guys, do you have a certain patient population that you so I, pick uh, maintenance? I would key in on how they did during induction. You okay. know, with, if they had a lot of infectious complications or cytopenias were potentially an issue, you're right, after, after six cycles of our chop, they're kind of staring at you saying, I'm glad I'm in remission, but really you want me to do this? you know, do some more. Uh, um, and I have a very frank discussion with them if we do go down the maintenance route. I have the, we have the discussion about we may stop. You know, committing to maintenance does not mean that you have to get through the full two years also yep. if you're having infectious complications or cytopenias. So, uh, uh, but I do continue to have the, dis have the discussion. Simon, are you, are you a maintenance pro or con? Or, or uh, I'm, I'm getting less pro than I was. I mean, in the UK, we give maintenance to anybody in follicular lymphoma, and generally that does happen. We give subcutaneous maintenance, of course, which is very easy for patients. Uh, I tend to give less of it now to older patients, particularly if you had a really good response to, to uh, your induction chemo. And I'm tending to stop early if anybody gets any kind of mild yeah. infection. So I'm, I'm starting it in less, and I'm stopping it earlier. Yeah. But generally, the commitment is to give it broadly. And it's interesting, go ahead. I was just going to say there are a couple questions from the audience oh, yeah. uh, come in just to inform the, the discussion here. The choice of our CHOP in this patient is frontline versus our bendamustine. Do you want to comment on that? And I know we want to keep you on track, but yeah. uh, just so, a word or two. Uh, I would say that in my practice now, I probably use more bendamustine than I do our CHOP, and I think this is uh, many times the use of chopper or bendamustine depends on sometimes where you came from and your experience with the two. Um, in this guy, because he presented, uh, so I do think there is a group of patients that, uh, pr that the biopsy shows follicular, but they present with large cell-like symptoms. And this guy, although um, you know, he's a little bit older, he presented with abdominal bloating. He had a fairly large mass in the abdomen. Yeah, I always wonder that uh, the biopsy, which is a needle biopsy, could it have missed some occult transformation? So in this gentleman, again, because he presented with significant symptoms, a large mass, abdominal bloating, I felt that there could be a potential that he had occult transformation we didn't pick up on biopsy, which is why I picked CHOP mm -hmm. over, over bendamustine. Good. Thanks. Um, and uh, John, any other, any other, so I know that we, you and I have talked, and I, there are patents that I sometimes do where Tuximab single agent in the front line. Is there a population? that you tend to use sure. that so, instead? I mean, I, I would say that patients with relatively lower tumor burden, um, that that is a, more of a, uh, a reasonable option. Uh, obviously, there are pros and cons, less toxicity, less efficacy. Yeah. Um, but a lower tumor burden patient who has preferences or indications for therapy would typically be the person I give single agent rituximab to. And there's good data. Yeah. I mean, there are, I mean, I think a lot of us know this SAC data, there's trials. They were done in Europe uh, that, uh, again, I think many of these patients are probably low tumor burden, but there are, are, is a group of patients that have had eight doses of rituximab, and if you look at almost 10 years out, nearly 40% of the patients, especially the patients who achieved complete remission, still in remission at almost 10 years with single agent rituximab. Issues we have no idea who, <laughs> who those people are. Uh, so as I talked, I went off on a little bit of a tangent. Rituximab plus chemotherapy, I think, is the standard of care in, in most places in the United States. I'll talk about some emerging options for frontline patients. But with these uh, chemo backbones, unfortunately, most patients will still relapse regardless of what we do. If you look at the long-term follow-up of uh, rituximab plus chemo from the PRIMA trial, uh, around 10 years out, only around 30% of patients uh, will still be in remission at 10 years. And usually when I see patients in clinic, I tell them most patients, regardless of the backbone, relapse within about five to seven years, uh, potentially extending that remission time a little bit with maintenance. So, you know, I think, again, especially in patients that present sometimes in their 40s and 50s, you have to be very cognizant that whatever I do now, I don't want to burn a bridge for, for receiving subsequent therapy because almost for sure uh, they will require some salvage at some point. So. What else could we do? Well, before I go on to that, I, I talked about this gentleman having symptoms. Uh, around, probably around 20 to 30% of our patients with follicular lymphoma, when they initially present, uh, will not have symptoms and will have 
low tumor burden. Now, there have been several randomized trials, mainly done in Britain, that have looked at the use of treatment, either chemotherapy or rituximab as a single agent, in patients that don't have symptoms. And at least so far, uh, we have not seen any difference in overall survival if you get treatment at diagnosis or if you wait until they develop symptoms. And I'm a kind of glass half full guy, so I usually tell my patients what that means is that, okay, it doesn't mean that you'll do better if you get treatment, but also means you won't do worse. So if we were to wait for six months and get a re-imaging study, there's no harm. In other words, the treatment works just as well now as it will six months from now. Uh, there's no loss in overall survival waiting to see if there will be one of these patients that may never need treatment or may go into a spontaneous remission. So in my patients, I usually wait for one of these criteria to emerge. Uh, I'm not going to go through them. Essentially, I tell the fellows, just think about if the disease is causing problems, you need to start treatment. So if it's bulky, if they're anemic, cytopenic, or if they're having symptoms, uh, then start treatment. Um, although I think I often say that the true art in fully lymphoma is not waiting until they have th symptoms, it's till right before they have symptoms, and that's sometimes a little bit harder to predict. There are lots of treatments. Again, I, I have a lot to go through, so I won't spend a whole lot of time here. I'm going to talk about lenalidomide rituximab. There are some studies looking at rituximab as a single agent in low tumor burden patients. Uh, lots of different options uh, according to the NCCN. I think these are all, all pretty accurate. Lots of things work in the front line. The problem is most of them are not curable. Uh, that's just a curative. Now, lenalidomide rituximab is something that uh, you know, we, we were fortunate to work on along with several other centers several years ago. There was a randomized trial done by the Northern Europeans where they, this was a small randomized trial where they looked at rituximab as a single agent or R squared. Uh, this was called the SAC 3510 trial. Pretty simple design. Patients had standard dosing of rituximab uh, for up to 15 weeks uh, or the combination. And you can see here, the, there was a significant difference in progression-free survival if patients received lenalidomide rituximab versus rituximab alone. Now, there have been several phase two trials uh, done by uh, several groups, including my own, that looked at lenalidomide rituximab in patients that had untreated follicular. These were single agent trials. And it was pretty interesting. Most of these trials showed very high overall and complete remission rates. In fact, those complete remission rates were as good and then sometimes maybe a little bit better than our chemo. But these were all phase two trials that were conducted uh, nearly almost 10 years ago, I think, that they've all been published. And like with any phase two trial, uh, when you see great results, you always have to wonder uh, how it would look in, in a randomized trial. And that was the purpose of the relevance trial, and this name was not developed by me, it was, I, I think, a company name. Relevance stood for Revlimid versus any chemotherapy. And the purpose of the trial was to try to show that lenalidomide rituximab, a non-cytotoxic regimen, was as good or better than our chemo. So in this trial, they allowed the physicians to pick any of the common chemo backbones. Remember I said that CVP, bendamustine, or CHOP? and that was in the, the control arm, or they were randomized to receive lenalidomide rituximab, which is R-squared. Now, this trial was designed back uh, right when the pre maintenance data was coming out, and so both arms received uh, versions of uh, maintenance for another two years after six months of induction. Primary endpoint was progression-free survival, and the study enrolled about 1,000 patients. This is uh, the uh, remission rates. You can see that they're fairly similar, maybe a couple percentage better with uh, our chemo compared to our CHOP. But interestingly, the duration of response was longer, a little bit, not statistically different, with uh, lenalidomide rituximab versus our chemo. These are your progression-free survival curves and overall survival. Unless you're sitting really close to the stage, this looks like the same line. You can see that uh, really almost identical progression-free survival and overall survival at a, a little bit over three years median follow-up. Now, this study uh, was built as a superiority trial, so we were hoping that lenalidomide rituximab would be better than our chemo. And so this was uh, actually my colleague Bruce Cheston said this is the most positive negative study that came out in 2018, meaning the study did not meet its primary endpoint, but for the first time, uh, we were able to show that a non-chemotherapy backbone was as good as our chemo with really identical progression-free survival curves and very similar overall 
and uh, CR rates. Now, as you can imagine, uh, there were different side effect profiles, and any of you that have used lenalidomide and rituximab know that it's associated with the unique toxicity profile. We see more patients with rash. Uh, patients can also occasionally get constipation or diarrhea, and it's associated with fatigue in many patients. With chemotherapy, uh, we see the side effects that we would expect with chemotherapy. That means neutropenia, febrile neutropenia, uh, nausea, vomiting, and alopecia. In fact, the neutropenia rate was nearly double in the R chemo arm, despite three times more growth factor use uh, compared to R squared. So I think you know when you're talking to patients about which of these to do, uh, R squared has now been adopted as a preferred regimen by the NCCN, um, and um, I, th I think all, all four options are fairly um, effective, R squared, R chop, uh, R bender, or um, RCVP, all of them are going to lead to very similar progression-free survival curves. And really, when you're talking to a patient, I think that you need to talk about the safety differences between the two arms. So I think it's a great option. It is my frontline option for patients. Uh, generally, well, I don't think there's uh, evidence of transformation. I promised I wouldn't talk too much about R squared in the front line of this event, but I can't help it. But the uh, the one place I would not use R squared is in patients where you suspect transformation. I think that it's clearly inferior to something like R chop in patients that have occult transformation. So if they've got high SUVs on PET or it's a grade 3B, do not use lenalidomide rituximab. Uh, R chop is, is definitely superior. We will see an abstract uh, by my uh, good friend and colleague, Loretta Nastapil, where we're looking at now substituting obinutuzumab uh, for rituximab. Uh, in the front line. So this is very similar to the uh, R-squared. The only difference is a newer antibody. And you can see uh, we have uh, over two years follow-up. PFS is over 90% at two years. So again, it's a single arm phase two. This would have to be confirmed with randomized trials, but substituting out a newer antibody looks extremely effective. How does that and compare with your R-squared, your original R-squared? So if you look at our PFS at two years, it's, it's a, it's, I want to say it's uh, in the high 70s, so it looks about 10% better. And I should mention, this study, unlike mine, this was all high tumor burden. So these, all these patients okay. had to be GELF criteria compared to our original phase two trials. So, so my concern about, uh, if we were going to talk about frontline, was the gallium data, you know, with obinutuzumab yes. substitution. And I've been waiting for this abstract. Yes. Can I just look at the infections? Uh, you know, that was one of the concerns that came out of gallium with the use yep. of obinutuzumab as the, as the chemo backbone. But did you see any infectious signals or no, comments? No, I, mean, I don't, I, I don't know what the grade 3 infection rate. I think mean, it was very low. I don't remember any patients actually getting neutropenic fever during this. Uh, and what Matt's referring to, I think many of you, and I think, John, you were, I, I think, I'm not sure if you were on the gallium. I know there's a bunch of us, but, yeah. but anyway, it's, uh, gal the Gallium trial looked at substituting a new antibody, so obinutuzumab instead of rituximab with one of those chemo backbones I mentioned, and that study was positive. It showed about a 7% be benefit at three years, I believe, uh, with substituting obinutuzumab for rituximab with a chemo backbone. And so, you know, I hope this is a kind of a follow-up if the gallium's positive. Uh, maybe we could put obinutuzumab with lenalidomide. I should mention this is not FDA approved, and uh, my official recommendation is don't do this outside of a clinical trial. But very nice PFS curves. We picked R squared for this patient based upon the AUGMENT trial. There are several things that are available for this patient if they relapse. Now, as I mentioned, I think many patients who relapse after R chop will get R bendamustine uh, or potentially R CVP. I really would not do R. R chop again. Many patients who relapse, especially after several years, have low tumor burden. Many times they get rituximab as a single agent. There are other recommended um, regimens per the NCCN that include some of the non chemotherapy based uh, treatments, such as the PI3 kinase inhibitors, and I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, that data in, in just a second. Now, the AUGMENT trial. Uh, is a trial that also looked at lenalidomide rituximab, but now this is in the relapse setting. A little bit different design. Uh, this uh, was just uh, published in JCO by Dr. Leonard here, uh, I think just uh, well, a couple months ago. And this uh, study was actually very similar to the relevance trial, except uh, in this trial they used rituximab as a single agent as the comparator arm. Pretty simple design. It was a one-to-one -one randomization that enrolled about 350 patients and gave them rituximab as a single agent with a 
placebo pill, or lenalidomide and rituximab. The, do the dosing was a little bit different. They could get up to 12 cycles of therapy as long as they were not progressing. A primary endpoint, similar to the relevance trial, was progression-free survival. And unlike the relevance trial, this did show a actually significant improvement in progression-free survival with the use of R-squared compared to rituximab as a single agent. You can see that uh, PFS was uh, significantly better for R-squared, medium PFS, 39 months versus 14 months of rituximab as a single agent. This is your overall and CR rates. You can see that they were also higher, 78% versus 53%. Overall response rate of R-squared versus rituximab as a single agent, and maybe a little bit of a trend here towards an improvement in overall survival, again, uh, in the uh, relapse setting. Now, as I mentioned, uh, with the relevance trial, these lenalidomide rituximab is associated with uh, a fairly unique side effect profile, just like with the relevance study, we did see some rash, we saw uh, some infections, all the vast majority of these were less than grade three or four. We did see a, a little bit of neutropenia, and I, my sense is that neutropenia with lenalidomide tends to get worse the longer uh, patients are on therapy. And many patients in this trial had to reduce the dose of lenalidomide as they were going through treatment because of uh, emerging neutropenia. It's uh, essentially looking at the augment data based upon uh, the patient's age. Uh, so you see that patients over 70 responded just as well as patients that were less than 70. You look at median progression-free survival, nearly double in patients over 70, uh, and it also looks very good for patients under 70. And th the purpose of this abstract was to show that um, even in patients who maybe are a little bit older, maybe uh, you would not consider for something like chemotherapy, lenalidomide rituximab works uh, quite well. I think many times patients over 70 at relapse are the patients that you think, maybe I'm going to do single agent rituximab because I'm a little worried about their tolerability uh, of a, a more aggressive salvage. But it looks like they did uh, quite well. So I think I went over these conclusions already. Uh, it's looked better than single agent rituximab. Uh, AEs were seen, and I do think that they were higher with lenalidomide rituximab, uh, especially grade three, four neutropenia and rash, although interestingly, the, the translated to nearly doubling and in the younger patient, almost tripling of the progression-free survival compared to rituximab as a single agent. If you think about lenalidomide, uh, again, I tend to use this in, in, in a lot of my patients. The main things that I look for are rash, and sometimes patients uh, require some dose reduction due to neutropenia. I like to think of dosing with lenalidomide as more of a kind of a dose optimization. And what that means is uh, many of you that have used this drug for myeloma, for example, know that as you continue patients on therapy, uh, it's interesting, the, the neutropenia, at least when we did uh, 12 cycles of lenalidomide in our initial trials, neutropenia rate actually decreases over time as patients get to the appropriate dose. And that's a little different than what we kind of see with chemotherapy where you know, each cycle uh, they tend to get higher rates of neutropenia. In fact, uh, our neutropenia rate uh, in our phase two trial when we had 12 cycles peaked at cycle three at around 30%, and it was only around 10% at cycle 12. And that's because many patients, once they get to that appropriate dose, and maybe it goes from 20 down to 15, once you get on 15, even though you continue with subsequent therapy, their neutropenia rate actually does not get worse. So I guess the first thing I'm getting at is there's been no significant evidence that dropping the dose uh, makes a big difference when it comes to efficacy in lenalidomide, but it's very nice to control the neutropenia. So if you have patients on lenalidomide rituximab and you have to drop to 15 or 10, uh, that, that should be still okay. There's some nice preclinical data that the immunologic, adver the immunologic effects of lenalidomide occur at very low doses. Uh, the other thing is the rash, and John, I don't know how you handle rash. We, uh, with patients on lenalidomide, I find we give them Claritin, especially if they get rash in the first cycle, I'll give them Claritin, take it while you're on lenalidomide, and many times that helps with, uh, with the rash. Agreed. Yes, anybody else have any I, I had a question, a question about the, the tumor flare, uh, because I yes. know that there are some recipes with uh, prednisone that are out there. Uh, do you ever preemptively treat uh, for I don't, a tumor flare, or do you wait for it to occur, yeah. manif manifest, and then try something along the so way? So one, one of the issues with tumor flare and lenalidomide, uh, well, let me back up a little bit. One of the issues with lenalidomide is when you add steroids, your rate of, of 
thrombosis really spikes. Uh, so it goes up to around 30% risk of a thrombotic event when patients are on steroids. So if you do start steroids because they have a high tumor burden, they should be on Lovenox uh, as well. Uh, so I don't prophylactically treat patients with high tumor burden. Uh, if they start to develop flare, I do think, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe seven to 10 days of, of steroids often will kind of cool that down. But in most patients, if they get a lot of tumor flare, as long as they're not obstructing a ureter and they're not having pain, I just watch it and it will usually resolve after about seven days without, uh, without intervention. So this guy got R squared and um, he unfortunately had um, progressive disease. So what should we do next? So remember he had R chop followed by two years of rituximab maintenance and then uh, got R squared, lasted a couple years, so three years, and is now progressing again. So let's just do the math, right? He uh, was 70, he had 74 relapsed uh, three years later, so he's 77. Uh, it still has good performance status, uh, but uh, it still, uh, still has his a little PTSD from getting R chop and is asking us, uh, you know, what, what would you do next? You guys? You don't want to give him dose reduced bendamustine rituximab then? I don't know. Would you? I work in a third world country. I don't have many options. So that's probably <laughs> what I do. Anybody else? So I would just maybe I'll just ask the panel real quick. I think you can see that uh, we what we, we picked here. But anybody? Uh, so again, he's had R-chop, and the audience feel free to if you guys have a, a something that you've used or want to want to hear about what we think. Uh, let us, I think you can type in no, something. I think, I yeah, uh, I think benamustine-based therapy is certainly reasonable. Uh, you know, there are data with obinutuzumab, obviously, in the refractory yeah. population in particular, but uh, uh, that would certainly be reasonable. Obviously, if he's got concerns about chemotherapy, yeah. um, that would influence the thing. And so he's 77? Yeah. I mean, I, I think ga there's a Gadolin, uh, you right. know, is the obinutuzumab, benamustine, but I hear you about the, the concern about chemotherapy. I think, you know, what you're going to talk about, I think, is because you said that there at the bottom is PI3 kind of, so I think it's a, a reasonable place to think about it. Also, kind of, I think people want to go back to retu the rituximab sink uh, on this and just say, what if we squeezed in, you know, four doses of rituximab and then uh, the whole thing, well, could I do maintenance at that point? Uh, and the data uh, for that is, you know, I would say lacking. Yeah. Uh, but it's often a question that's asked by the patient, can't you just give me a little vitamin R? Sure. So he's still... But his issue isn't chemotherapy. He's still rituximab sensitive. sensitive right. Yeah. His issue isn't chemotherapy. His issue is the side effects he had with CHOP. Right. Yes. You know, and you should be talking to people about effective therapy, not chemotherapy. You know? Yes. And bedamustine toxicity profile is different. Yeah. Okay. You give him four cycles low dose. Give him so when you say low dose, bendamustine, what's the dose? 70. <laughs> 70. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I think that that's interesting because the 70 comes from the CL, you know, the, I've always looked for it, it comes from the CLL data, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, this whole, uh, in the what? relapse refractory setting, that's, that is the dose. Um, so we, people have been, you know, we talk about borrowing from other diseases, that that's where I, I agree with you. If I'm going to use bendamustine in, you know, multiple lines of therapy, I, I'm going to talk about dose reducing or, or have a very low threshold with subsequent cycles. Yeah. And usually stop at four. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what about the single agent rituxan or single agent obinutuzumab? Well, I think he's rituximab sensitive, so I'd have the discussion uh, with them that the mileage, you know, the law of diminishing returns may, may occur, mm -hmm. but, uh, um, you know, at that point, y you will define yourself as rituximab refractory, and then you can go on to, you know, potentially other, other lines of therapy. Okay. Um, so we talked about uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors. I'm going to show you a little bit of the data. And I'll talk to you about the, the, the current ones that are FDA approved and the differences between these three. Uh, we decided after kind of going through the different options to start him on duvalizib. He started on 25 milligrams twice a day. So there are uh, now um, three, about to be four of these that are FDA approved. Uh, PI3 kinase inhibitors. Has everyone knows about these drugs? Yes and no, sort of. Okay, great. I've got a couple hands. So I, um, PI3 kinase inhibitors have been actually, of, of all the diseases where these, uh, so all the hematologic diseases where these have been very effective, follicular lymphoma has probably been the closest to a home run uh, for these diseases, although I might say it's more like a double or a triple. But uh, we know that the PI3 kinase pathway is important in the pathogenesis of many different B-cell cancers. We've looked at these kind of drugs across different malignancies, 
And uh, we've seen that in follicular lymphoma, when you use these drugs as, as single agents, you see responses, uh, depending on the, the study, somewhere around 50 to sometimes as high as almost 70% using these drugs. All of these PI3 kinase inhibitors uh, are, I should say, fairly specific for PI3 kinase. They do hit a couple different isoforms. A couple of them hit a couple of the kinases, which I, I won't go into in detail. Most of these things are fairly specific for the delta isoform. Uh, Copanolizib also hits alpha and beta, and uh, as well as a little bit of gamma. Uh, Duvalizib hits gamma and delta, and I'll talk to you a little bit about why that's important in a second. Uh, you can see by the, the structure of these, uh, these three are all fairly similar. Umbralizib looks a little bit different. Uh, two of the, three of these are oral and one of them is IV. Now, these drugs, as I mentioned, are quite effective in follicular lymphoma. If you look at the overall response rate uh, from the kind of pilot drug in this class, idelalizib, it's pretty good. If you look at this waterfall plot, again, anything below the line here means tumor reduction. Almost all the patients that received this drug in the relapse setting uh, had some response in their tumor. Uh, this was around 50-odd percent response rate. Um, in patients with follicular lymphoma, these little lines here uh, match the different histologies, but uh, the ones that we generally think about are the follicular lymphoma patients. This drug uh, was approved, I think now about three years ago, for follicular lymphoma based upon this phase two uh, trial. This up here is a, a different trial. This is, uh, I think, the randomized trial that was done, I can't remember the name of this trial, but. Um, Anyway, it showed it's better than uh, rituximab placebo if you combine it with rituximab. Duvalizib is another drug which was recently approved for indolent lymphomas. Uh, it also has, as I mentioned, an overall response rate, you know, around 50 to 60 percent, depending on the dose level. Uh, the CR rates are, are fairly low. And you can see progression-free survival similar to what we had seen with idelalizib, it's about a year. So these, all of these drugs are gonna get you right around 11 months to a year uh, progression-free survival in relapsed follicular lymphomas. The Dynamo study was a study that looked at duvalizib and double refractory indolent non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. And double refractory means they were failing an alkylator, which essentially means cyclophosphamide or bendamustine, and were refractory to rituximab, in other words, progressing within six months. Uh, this was a pretty beat-up population uh, uh, of patients. They had a median number of three prior therapies. As I mentioned, everybody had to be retu rituxan and refractory to an alkylator. Uh, you can see they enrolled around 120 patients. Again, waterfall plot looks very similar to the Idelalizib waterfall plot. Most patients responding, uh, overall response rate right around 50%, and the little colors on those hatch marks match the histology. Most of them were follicular lymphoma. Progression-free survival almost 10 months, uh, and again, I think t the difference between 10 and 11 months is probably uh, just in, due to the patients that they enrolled. And it looks like, you know, I just cut and pasted this waterfall plot for each one of these drugs. Uh, again, this is, co this is now the Copanolizib data. Again, you can see that around 80 plus percent of patients had some reduction in tumor volume, and the, and the overall response rate, again, around 50%, 59% response rate with uh, copanolizib, CR rate of 12%. Median duration of response, a year progression-free survival, also 11 months. And here's your uh, progression-free survival uh, curves, again, showing around 11 months. Uh, the last drug, which uh, is currently has breakthrough designation by the FDA and will probably be going forward with at least a marginal zone approval and probably a follicular lymphoma approval within the next year is umbralizib. Uh, here, this is smaller. The phase two trial has not been uh, reported, but if you were to stretch this curve out, uh, again, in uh, the uh, follicular lymphomas, it looks fairly similar to what we've seen with the other uh, drugs. Overall response rate, 53%, very similar to what we've seen with the other PI3 kinase inhibitors. So, you guys that have these things available in practice, how do you pick? If you can't tell the way I'm kind of leading, a lot of these drugs with regards to efficacy are pretty doggone similar. Overall response rate, fairly similar. All of them have a low CR rate and progression-free survivals are all right around a year plus or minus. And I think this really has to do with 
the, how you deliver the drug, and uh, the side effect profile. But the PI3 kinase inhibitors, as a class, we've seen GI side effects, and it tends to be a little higher or lower depending on the drug that you use. Both Idelizib and Duvalizib have been associated with a little more uh, diarrhea and some colitis. The early studies with Idelizib, this was often very severe. In fact, we had some patients that actually had fatal events due to uh, hemorrhagic colitis and severe diarrhea. Now, I think as we've begun to learn how to treat patients with these drugs, uh, this has become less. And if you take one thing away from me today, uh, if you start patients on a PI3 kinase inhibitor, if they have diarrhea more than four times a day, stop the drug. Most of the patients that had uh, fatal events in the early trials were because, you know, it's an oral drug. Patients would come in, they have low-grade lymphoma, they get this drug. The, the oncologist says, here's your PI3 kinase inhibitor, come back and see me in a month. Patients would go to an outside ER with severe diarrhea, and they're like, okay, they check them for C. diff, and they continue their idelalizib. And again, at the time, because there wasn't a lot of education about the side effects of this drug, uh, we were dosing patients even in the face of adverse events. Now, I think as we begin to learn these drugs, uh, stop the drugs if they can develop diarrhea. If the diarrhea does not resolve in two days, start them on a steroid. And if it's not better in about four days, honestly, I would admit them to the hospital uh, for intravenous fluids. Most of these patients will recover if you stop the drug and treat them appropriately. Copanilizib, as I mentioned, it hits a different isoform. I'm down to a couple seconds left, so I'll just finish off. Uh, it does, uh, it's associated with some hyperglycemia and hypertension. This drug is given IV. Uh, so it is a, a little bit different on the way you administer it. As some patients like this because they get to come and see you in your clinic. And um, uh, the, there's no real worry about uh, compliance because they're getting an IV. It does have less colitis. Most of the times the hyperglycemia and hypertension are very, very transient. And it, it's really quite easy to get patients through this. Again, all of these are, are very effective in, in low-grade lymphomas. So I think the take-home... Uh, with uh, how to sequence patients. Think about these patients over the long term as I've tried to show you through lots of these slides. Unfortunately, uh, in the frontline or in a relapse setting, relapse is still common. Most of these regimens are not curative, and so you generally always have to think about what's the next therapy. So I really try to avoid things that are gonna lead to permanent adverse events, and that means you know, watching for neuropathy, Pay, don't use uh, a CHOP in patients that have any risk of cardiac events, meaning history of heart disease. Uh, talk to the patient about the goal of therapy and think about the side effects of all of these drugs. They're all very effective. Uh, they just have very different side effect profiles. Lots of options. There's lots of things coming out. Uh, I think I talked about this, pay attention to cumulative toxicities. Ooh. And uh, there are lots of things that are coming down the pipeline, especially things like CAR T cells, which uh, may dramatically change uh, the landscape of follicular lymphoma treatment over the next couple of years. Well, now we move to mantle cell lymphoma. It's great to have Simon Rule from, yes. from Plymouth here to uh, talk to us about novel agents and future directions in MCL. Simon. Thanks very much, and good morning. Um, England's still in the EU just. Uh, and by the way, I don't have the ego that demands that I have professor in front of my name. I don't quite know why that happened. It didn't happen to everybody else, so <laughs> nothing to do with me, okay? <laughs> Okay, what am I going to talk about? Uh, a little bit on prognostic factors, um, a little bit on indolent mantle cell lymphoma, which I think we increasingly recognize but can't diagnose very effectively, and then management of younger and older patients. So then we'll sort of basically major on relapse, and particularly the BTK inhibitors, and I've got a slide that you might want to take a picture of, which is the comparative e efficacy of four BTK inhibitors, including some data that's not been published yet. Okay, risk factors. So here's the MIPI, okay? This is well established. Uh, three beautiful curves there, LDH, white cell count, uh, age, and performance status. Very nice. Um, helpful? Not helpful at all. So in the clinic, that's not a useful thing. But in a clinical trial, very useful, because of course you want to have balance between arms, but you're never going to use a MIPI to dis distinguish how you're going to treat somebody. And it's highly affected by age MIPI. That's the other important factor there. One of the most important things in mantle cell lymphoma, possibly the most important thing, is how proliferative the disease is. Now, this is, it's not unique to mantle cell, but it's the most important in mantle cell. So the more proliferative the disease, the worse the outcome. 
Key 67, a notoriously difficult thing to do from your pathology colleagues. So here's a way of doing it in a more reproducible way. This is David Scott from Vancouver using a nanostring platform, 35 genes. This incorporates that proliferation. And again, three very nice curves. It's very reproducible, as you can see on the right there. So again, it uh, gives you similar kind of prognostic information. Useful? No, not useful at all either. But again, in trials, uh, this is what you want to have. So you've got balance. This is the latest kind of thing in the world of lymphoma. If you progress early, you do worse than if you progress late. Yeah, OK. Um, uh, t tell me a disease where that isn't the case. Um, and of course, that's of no use to you whatsoever at diagnosis, because you don't know whether you're going to be an early or late progressor. But again, in the context of clinical trials, this is useful, because again, you want to see balance between arms here. This group obviously does better than this group. Uh, this, however, is of incredible significance from a prognosis point of view, and we'll come on to how you might want to uh, manage this. This is P53 mutation, not deletion, just mutation. These are young patients in the Nordic trials doing spectacularly badly. So these are young, fit patients getting high-dose cytarabine-based regimen, and this is survival, and you can see half of those patients have died within two years. We'll come back to that in a second. And then this is the latest cab off the rank. This is a, an Italian study just published looking at genetic profiling in young patients, again, in a high-dose regimen uh, trial with a lenalidomide maintenance question. And the things that stand out here, P53 deletion and mutation, and then the new player here, KMTT2D, no, I can't even say it, <laughs> 2D mutation, epigenetic modifier. Um, this was done differently. This was looking at um, mantle cells within the bone marrow rather than the tumour. So this is different to the Nordic data, so they are slightly different. But these two uh, factors come out as being very prognostic. And we've now got a new player now. This is the MIPI G, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> this is the MIPI genetic. So we've got three more curves. Again, is that helpful for you? No, not at all. But anyway, so you can see there are prognostic factors that play out that give you survival differences. But as a clinician, uh, it's of interest, but of no clinical relevance, at least right now. So here's a treatment algorithm. I guess I've bored people with this over the years. But the, the first question comes down to, do you require therapy? And if I'd stood here 15 years ago and said, I watch and wait mantle cell lymphoma, people would say, you're absolutely mad. This is an aggressive disease. You've got to treat it straight away. And some people still believe that. But I think we, we now recognize there are a group of patients where you can quite legitimately watch them. And this indolent phenotype does exist. And I just picked one of a number of studies that have shown that observation versus initial treatment, you can see used, there's no detriment in observing people. This is from Vancouver. And on the right, this is how long patients are watched before they need treatment. So you can see there's some patients that go phenomenal length of time before they need therapy. And I've got a number of patients that I've watched for over 10 years without treatment. And these aren't leukemic patients. We recognize now this new entity within the WHO of this leukemic non-nodal mantle cell lymphoma uh, type, uh, as manifest by this SOX11 phenotype. These are patients who presented truly leukemic without nodal disease. And within that group, if you compare them to patients presenting with nodal uh, d disease, then this SOX11 is uh, clearly helpful. However, most patients don't present like that. Most patients present with nodal disease, where SOX11 is of no use whatsoever. So this isn't something I ever do. Uh, in patients who have a lymph leukemic presentation, they are more likely to be indolent, but they're not exclusively going to be. But nodal disease, you can watch just as effectively. In fact, this is a watch and wait uh, trial, which is going to be updated at ASH this time. We showed this uh, last ASH. This is a, a large um, prospective um, cohort of patients in the UK, but now I've got 550 patients. So we're just collecting biopsy material at diagnosis and patients who can be watched following very much the same um, outlines as Nathan just uh, elucidated with follicular. These, that quite a significant number of patients can be watched from diagnosis. It's slightly less than that now with more patients. 70% of these patients are nodal. 70% are nodal. So, it's, so whilst leukemic is, is a common type, do you can watch it's not exclusive. And look here, MIPI, an absolute waste of time in trying to predict who those <laughs> patients are. Okay? Why is that? Because if you've got a high white cell count and you're over 60, you are high risk MIPI. Those are just the patients you should be watching. So ignore the MIPI. But the kind of things you might expect, the more proliferative the tumor is, the, more, the less likely you are to be able to watch it. So it's sort of common sense. So the bottom line with 
Indolent mantle cell lymphoma is the way to find out if someone's got indolent disease is to leave them alone. Okay? That's the only thing you can do. We are hoping, by the way, and we've now got material with quite lengthy follow-up of this group of patients, that we will be able to find a biomarker. Rather than looking at retrospective patients that have done well, this is a, an entire population-based approach, so we'll see if we can find something that distinguishes between this group and this group. The one thing that does stand out, which I've actually said for many years and nobody's agreed to me, females have a more indolent behaving disease. So 60% of females can be watched to start with. Females have more indolent disease. Okay? They're not more indolent, they have more indolent disease. <laughs> I have three daughters, I can say that. Um, okay, so you're going to treat somebody. Uh, your next question is, are they fit for an autologous stem cell transplant? And if they are, there are a, a range of high-dose cytarabine containing regimens you can adopt. doesn't probably matter too much which one you would use. I'm um, stood next to Nathan, and I've always said don't use hypercevad. Uh, now people don't necessarily disagree with me anymore. Um, the one thing I would say is you don't cure anybody down here. So my approach is uh, I'm, I'm less inclined to take the fit 70-year-old down this route than I used to be. This isn't relapsed, diffuse, large B-cell where you really want to affect a cure, so you're going to push it. I don't push it anymore with these patients. And that's largely because the outcomes with chemotherapy are much better than we thought they were, and subsequent treatments are much better now. But you need cytarabine. Okay, this is the only randomized trial. The blue curve there is RCHOP followed by a transplant, and the upper curve is RCHOP alternating with RDHAP followed by a transplant. So which, however you look at these curves, the cytarabine does improve the outcome. Uh, so I think whatever you use, you've got to have cytarabine in there, and that would include bendamustine. So if you're going to use BR, I don't believe you should use BR followed by a transplant. If you use BR, I think you should have some cytarabine following it. What about after the transplant? So this is a very good trial from our French colleagues using a, a platinum-based treatment followed by a beam transplant and then a randomization to rituximab maintenance versus observation, and this showed very nicely a survival benefit. So if you're going to do high-dose cytarabine followed by an autologous stem cell transplant, you need to give patients rituximab maintenance. This was for three years. Whether you need three years or two years or to progression, nobody really knows, uh, but the data is the data. Uh, at Lugano, Steve showed their updated trial using abinutuzumab, which seemed to be slightly <coughs> better. There were higher MRD negativity before the transplant, and that might be very important. Because if you're MRD negative, you do better than if, if you're MRD positive. Again, a fairly obvious statement. You know, the better the control of the disease, the better you're going to do. Um, but this might be relevant because do you actually need a transplant if you're MRD negative? And that's the big question. Um, so, for example, in patients that I get to see who are sort of over 65, they've had a good response to high-dose cytarabine-based treatment, but they, you know, they can't get to the transplant because they're not fit enough. I simply, simply just put them on rituximab maintenance, and they may not have been disadvantaged by not having that transplant. Here's the answer. Hopefully, this is an American study, and the neat bit's up here. So if you're taking patients after an induction, who are MRD negative and are in complete remission as a randomization to transplant or with rituximab maintenance or rituximab maintenance. So I think that's a very important study. And if that shows that you don't need a transplant if you're MRD negative, then MRD, MRD assessment will become part of clinical practice in this disease. It isn't at the moment because we're not making treatment decisions on it, but we might do in the future based on this uh, important study. <coughs> There's a but with autologous stem cell transplant. And the but is, nobody is cured. <coughs> if you've been at ASH, I can't remember how many years ago it was now, when the Nordic group first showed their data, they had cure in the title of the abstract. It's a very dangerous thing to do with mantle cell lymphoma, just as it is in myeloma. Nobody's cured. Everybody relapses. And that's why I say in those, in those kind of fit older patients, pushing somebody hard with a transplant might not be in their best interests. But within this group, again, we've got this this group of patients who do really, really badly. Now, what are we going to do with this group? Because we recognize this has been a particularly bad group of players. Well, you know I tore the world talking about BTK inhibitors, so you're going to say, I know what the answer is here. It's, uh, it's ibrutinib, isn't it? No, it's not. Uh, <laughs> if you give ibrutinib to P53 mutated patients, just over 50% respond, and they don't respond for very long. So actually, it's not the answer. You might have thought they'd do better than that. Um, it's better than any other drug, mind you, but it's not very good. So what are you going to do with this group of patients, this young, fit group of patients in this situation? Well, I think now's the time to go to a now cheap treatment called an allogeneic stem cell transplant. 
And this is EBMT data looking at an alginate stem cell transplant and showing that it absolutely overcomes that P53 prognostic significance. So my practice, now I accept this is controversial, my French colleagues don't agree with me. In young patients that I see at diagnosis, I will look for a P53 mutation. If there's one there, I will consolidate whatever response I get with an alginate stem cell transplant, not an autologous stem cell transplant. Others suggest you should do an auto first and wait for them to relapse, but I've seen too many patients who are too ill after an autologous stem cell transplant to even consider doing something afterwards. I think you get, you get one bite of the cherry with these patients. I don't check it in older patients because there's not very much I can do with that information. So most people sit here. There are the average age of presentation of this disease, 72 in my country. So the question is, are they fit for a CHOP-like treatment? There are four options. There they are. Our CHOP, CHOP including Velcade, Bendamustium rituximab, and this very nice Italian regimen. And whilst these would appear that the our CHOP is the most inferior, that doesn't take any account of maintenance. And maintenance makes a big, big difference in this disease. It adds a lot to RCHOP, it adds nothing to bendamustine rituximab. So if you take it as a package, RCHOP followed by rituximab maintenance may well be just as good as BR with or without maintenance. Um, but let's look at this VR CAP study because this isn't very widely uh, applied. This is substituting Velcade for vincristine. Big study up front in elderly patients and a big progression free survival benefit in favor of the Velcade containing arm. And you may not have seen the follow-up of this study, but there's a survival benefit, a big survival benefit. So if you're going to give our chop, you probably should be incorporating Velcade. The, the trouble with this study is patients had it intravenously. They had it twice a week, just like we used to do in myeloma. So that gives toxicity. If you give it subcutaneously at a slightly higher dose and you added maintenance here, you probably get some very impressive outcomes. Um, so if you're going to use chop, you probably should be incorporating Velcade. I suspect this might be a regimen that's going to be used increasingly post BTK inhibitors as lots of people are using bendamustine front line. Lenalidomide rituximab, I must admit I, I, I've not used this up front, that's logic because we're not allowed to in my country, but I've used a lot of lenalidomide in mantle cell lymphoma. And th this small study has some very impressive results using the two drugs up front, but it was initially designed to exclude any high risk patients. Some were included later on. My view with lenalidomide, if you were going to use it up front, is it's very similar to the analogy Nathan just gave you about why you'd use CHOP and not bendamustine. I think if a disease is moving a bit quickly, the patient said, well, I would not use this. I'd go for chemotherapy. It works, in my experience, in a relapse setting, much better in patients with disease who's less proliferative. Uh, and again, for some reason, it works better in women. So it's an active regimen. But I, I, I kind of rail against this chemo-free. I, I, don't, I don't like that expression. This is, a, this is a combination of drugs that works. It has toxicity. 50% of these people get neutropenia. That's chemotherapy in my book. Long-term follow-up, though, again, it's impressive. So, I mean, it is definitely a, 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 a drug that works. And there are some important maintenance studies ongoing at the moment to, to explore whether lenalidomide plus rituximab post-treatment, be that transplant or chemotherapy, is beneficial. This is the Italian regimen. If, if you've not used this, this is a very neat way of treating uh, patients. This is what I use post-BTK uh, inhibitor. So it's lower dose of bendamustine, very active. This is up front, elderly patients, highly effective. Uh, works well, you can dose reduce that still further and it, and it works well. Okay, so here's a patient. So 65-year-old guy, who's now called George. Uh, PCP apparently is, uh, is American for a general practitioner. I didn't know that. I thought this was a chest infection. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's now three years post his treatment. He did very well. He had his transplant. He's three years post that. Uh, so he's had a good lengthy remission and he's relapsed. So what would your approach be in a patient of that age? So he's 60, let's say he's 69 now. He's not fit for an allograph, okay? Let's say we're not going down that route. Um, so he's had a good response to frontline chemo. What do you want to do? Dr. Fowler? I mean, I think this uh, guy would be great for a brutinib as a single agent. Agree. Yeah. Agreed. Oh, God, it's pretty <laughs> easy, isn't it? Who'd give him chemotherapy again? Because this is the scenario where people say to me most, for, this is why I'll give, uh, this is, these are the patients I give chemotherapy to. You know, if I have a very good response to chemo, we'll give them chemo again, we'll, we'll know they get a response. Well, so, so Simon, that's just a, to, provoke, to be provocative, yeah. is there any, any rationale, at least intuitively, to quote-unquote save ibrutinib? 
um, or save a BTK inhibitor for later and say, well, maybe we can get some more mileage out of chemo or mileage out of lenalidomide and save a brutinib for later. And I, I'm not advocating that, I'm just asking the, the question. Very good question. I'm going to show you the data that answers it for you. So these are the, these are the drugs that are now licensed. Now, uh, you will notice Xanabrutinib has just been licensed in the US. Uh, but what stands out is the BTK inhibitors clearly are the most efficacious from a response point of view. And I'll show you comparative data on the BTKs in a second. Here's the data to, to tell you that you really should, if you're going to use a BTK, you should use it early. Here's the pooled analysis. Uh, the update is coming uh, this ash, showing a big, big benefit if you use the drug at first relapse rather than later. As Dr. Rule notes, a recent update to this study showed that the use of ibrutinib in the second versus later lines of therapy for mantle cell lymphoma extended median PFS and increased likelihood of a complete response. And if you get a good response, they're very durable. Uh, again, whether you've had one prior line or not, but again, the PRs, which is what most patients get, are considerably different uh, depending on how early you use the drug. So, as, as, on a population basis, this 370 patients, early use is better. <coughs> but what about that group of patients I just talked about? Well, first things first, if you give chemotherapy followed by chemotherapy, you get less response. This is from uh, New York, but it's exactly the same pattern as you see with follicular lymphoma. But what about those good group I've just shown you? Well, this is, a, Ash, this is an update on this. So these are the patients in the pooled analysis who got ibrutinib at first relapse when the patients had a more than two year benefit from their chemotherapy. And these are the ones that get the most benefit. So the patients that get the best benefit from ibrutinib, and this will be the same for all the BTK inhibitors, are those that get the best benefit from chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And it's, you get more than a year additional PFS after the ibrutinib than you did with your first chemotherapy. So that's, that's to answer the question that really that's, that's the group you should be going for. CNS disease, um, a very difficult thing to manage. You can, you can stick this patient into the matrix and do whatever you like and it, it won't work very well or for very long. This patient here is moribund. We put a brutinib down a nasogastric tube. You can do that. The patient's awake the next day and this is about four months later. The wow. date on that scan is June 2015. I saw this guy two weeks ago. He's still on single agent abrutinib. Now, you should always ignore anecdotes because there's always an anecdote, good or bad, but this is spectacular. So this guy has just not relapsed. We, we published a series of six patients. They all responded, but they all relapsed eventually. So what you do subsequently, I don't know. But this guy, for some reason, just continues on drug. If a drug works in lymphoma, you add rituximab, right? So this is uh, our IR, this is Michael's data from the MD Anderson, which would appear to be better than uh, ibrutinib as a single agent, but again, there's no randomized data, there will never be any randomized data, so you take a view whether you think that improves. Actually, most people don't add rituximab, uh, which is interesting. What about taking R squared and then adding uh, ibrutinib? So here's, here's that triplet, this is the Philemon study. Uh, Came with quite a bit of toxicity. Whenever you add lenalidomide, you introduce toxicity. If you look at the uh, complete response rate, 64% looks much higher than, than IR or certainly I by itself. But N is 42. There were 50 patients in this study. Eight withdrew because of toxicity or withdrew consent. However, if you look in closely in the small print of this study, or the, the P53 mutated patients did just as well as the non-P53 mutated patients. So maybe just a hint that that really bad group of patients may be combinations like this, maybe the way forward. It's very, small, it's very small patient numbers, but just a hint that maybe combinations of novel agents in this particularly difficult patient group might give us some, some uh, additional benefit. So here's my next one. This is, this is a 91-year-old, so I, I, I don't work in an ivory tower. I see, I see everybody. So I'm faced with this guy here. Uh, this is uh, mantle cell lymphoma. He's a pretty fit guy. He's an ex-professional footballer, actually. He's got shocking knees, but um, apart from that, he's got a big lump of mantle cell lymphoma. Now, I treated him with chlorambosil rituximab. Now, why would I do that? Uh, because in the UK we love Clambosil, right? It's cheap, <laughs> it's a non-specific uh, drug. It has few in the way of side effects. Gosh, if it was a targeted therapy, it'd be worth a fortune, wouldn't it? Um, and it didn't work. Surprise, surprise. So what would you do next in this guy? I know what you're going to say. You're going to say BTK nib, aren't you? Uh, which one? You've got Xanabrutinib now. Which one do you want to give him? Acalabrutinib. You want to say Acalabrutinib? 
Todd's fine. I, I, I probably, I, I don't have a strong preference between the two, actually, a Calabrutin or a Brutin. Yeah, I'd say a Brutin if you have the longest track record. So I, I give people like this Clarambacil not because I think it's going to work, because I know it's not going to work, and then I can put them on a BGK inhibitor. So in the UK, NICE, our government body, allows us to use Ibrutinib at first relapse, but only at first relapse. So that's, th this guy actually didn't get Ibrutinib, he got a Calabrutinib in a trial. Spectacular response. Wow. Um, this is the, actually the pictures that Michael used in his A. Calabrutinib presentation. <laughs> it's my patient. Um, that's all right. I'm used to that. Um, so, certainly for the frail elderly population, this is where the BTK inhibitors, I think, have the most benefit. And these are, this is really where these should, drugs should be being used up front because whatever chemotherapy you're going to use in a patient like this, you're just going to give them toxicity. So I think we need to really be pushing to try and use these drugs earlier in this group of patients. One, one thing here, though, this guy got absolutely spectacular bruising. So in any elderly patient of mine, I stop aspirin when I start ibrutinib. I use ibrutinib or, or, or second generation as my uh, um, aspirin. So significant bruising on a calibrutinib, okay? You still get it with the, all the BTK inhibitors. And here they are. So this is tirabrutinib, acalabrutinib, xanabrutinib. This is a German BTK inhibitor. If I showed you this slide in three months' time, there'll be two more on there. And of course, these are all covalent ones. There are non-covalent ones coming, which don't bind to the same place. These all bind to the same place. From an efficacy point of view, these drugs are the same, okay? There are side effect differences, but efficacy, in my opinion, are, are the same. This is just a calibrutinib, just as a sort of an example. They are more specific, so they are, don't have the uh, off-target effects that ibrutinib have, which may have certainly some explanation for why you get the side effects. Interestingly, if you've got Bruton's disease, you do not get blue bruising and bleeding, so we still don't really fully understand the mechanism behind that. So this is the, this is the slide, right? This is the one you should, this is your iPhone moment. Uh, this is the comparative efficacy of the BTK inhibitors in mantle cell lymphoma. I'm even showing you here, this is in press, right? This is tirabrutinib, uh, the ONO4059 drug. Um, the medium prior lines of therapy makes a huge difference to outcome. So you need to look at this before you say whether a drug is better or worse. And certainly a brutinib more heavily pretreated than the acalabrutinib, 48% of these patients had only had one prior line of therapy. So that makes a massive difference to efficacy. So they all pretty much the same. The one thing that, although look at tirabrutinib, small numbers of patients, they were the most heavily pretreated. That's why I like this drug the most. This was around before acalabrutinib even went into a patient. This is fascinating. So xanabrutinib's just got a license in the US, uh, and there are two studies here. This study is uh, the phase one, actually. So these patients are sort of pretty comparative to what you'd see with, with most of the BTKs. This group of patients have had two prior lines of therapy, and look at that CR rate. This is a Chinese-only population, and there's, there's much, much less bruising and bleeding in this group as well. So something about a Chinese population, and if you're at IWCLL this year, there was some ibrutinib data in the Ch Hong Kong Chinese population where there was much less bruising and bleeding as well. So there may be something about a Chinese-only population. Of interest, all this was used as in, the, in, in the FDA submission. So just when, when the, when the Xanabrutinib people come and show you this number, just be, just be careful as to where that came from, okay? But broadly, they're the same in my view. This is what everybody thinks, and certainly that was the case when we first started using Ibrutinib. Uh, this was what everybody thinks is the answer. And if you use Venetoclax as a single agent, the response rate looks virtually identical to Ibrutinib, PFS and response rate, but none of these patients have had Ibrutinib. What happens post ibrutinib? Here's the data. This is from the UK. Basically, about 60% respond, but the PFS is three months. So it just doesn't work very well. This is not the answer. What's slightly disappointing, I guess, in the world of novel therapies is that the most effective thing is this here. So this is the, what we started doing a couple of years ago. I, I wanted to give people cytarabine because the disease is more prolific post a BTK inhibitor. And this combination just works really, really well. We've got data on 36 patients now. It's in press in the British Journal of Hematology. Response rate's 90%. So it's higher than previous chemotherapies, higher than lenalidomide, higher than venetoclax. So uh, unfortunately, in the world of you know, novel agents, chemotherapy still has a place. And I'm sure this is largely to do with the cytarabine. That 
Cytarabin bender combination is really very effective. And you can drop the doses here very effectively in elder, frailer patients. So where are we going? Obviously up front. So this is IR up front uh, in young patients. Michael's data from the MD Anderson. And this is following the IR with hypersevad and then stopping therapy. Uh, do you need the hypersevad? Maybe not. This is elderly patients using the same combination. Again, good responses, but quite a lot of these patients actually uh, stop taking treatment, probably because they maybe not too symptomatic to start with, and so symptoms then become an issue. This excluded uh, high-risk patients, by the way. So important trials, this is the trial running in the UK. This is IR versus our chemo, our chemo being Bender or CHOP. There's almost 300 patients in this trial now. We do not exclude patients who are high key 67. We do not exclude patients who are blasting a blastoid variant, and this actually, the IR does actually work in blastoid patients. So this is asking a, a, a PFS question, there's rituximab uh, in both arms, and, and one of the interesting things here, although the statisticians don't like it, is that you can actually compare CHOP with bendamustine, because they're, um, they're both getting maintenance. This is Martin's study, incorporating ibrutinib into high-dose cytarabin, uh, containing regimen, do you need the transplant, an important question. And then possibly the most active regimen we've got, this is venetoclax uh, with ibrutinib, 24 patients in Melbourne, very, very high CR rate, and of note, 50% of these patients were P53, and it responded. So, again, maybe this is a way of getting over that bad prognostic group of patients. That's my only slide on CAR T cells, because <laughs> you're going to have to wait and see what the data looks like. Yeah, I'm just going to finish with this. This is my vision of the future, right? I think right now you could see a, a vision where there's no <laughs> chemotherapy at all. BTK combination, now that's probably a BTK plus venetoclax. And we'll use MRD, and that could be cell-free DNA or whatever. And if that remains positive, you know they're going to relapse. So that might be where you kick in with some cellular therapy, which could be CAR-T, could be some kind of transplant procedure. In, in older patients, you may well use MRD as a, as a rationale for stopping therapy, and I think if we're confident in stopping in older patients, we'll then become confident in stopping in younger patients. And in the frail elderly, I think you, anything you add to a BTK, you, you introduce toxicity, so I think it's going to be BTK by itself. So that's how I see the future. Uh, in five years, you can tell me I'm wrong, and I'm going to stop. Five seconds, go on, somebody owes me a drink. <laughs> Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, and now it's great to have Matt Lunning from the University of Nebraska, who's going to give us an update on large cell lymphoma. Matt. Thank you. So we'll jump right in here to stay on time, because I'm sure there are plenty of questions trickling in. So I'm going to tell you the story about Martha. And so uh, Martha pre uh, presents to her primary care physician or her general practitioner. Thank you. She's a 63-year-old female. And she was just coming in for uh, her routine annual physical. And I was getting a screening mammography. And believe it or not, on mammography, you can see uh, shadows of lymph nodes. And they will call them uh, on the mammography. And that's what happened to this uh, individual, is that they called bilateral axillary lymph nodes. Uh, they went back and they compared uh, to prior mammograms, she had been very good about getting her annual screening, and they were not seen on prior, uh, uh, prior mammograms. They actually did a physical exam and noted that these lymph nodes were abnormal in size, about two to three centimeters. And because you can in the United States now, and in fact in residencies, they're commonly teaching them to uh, carry uh, ultrasounds that are handheld, or some of them are plug-in devices. Uh, they pulled out their ultrasound, confirmed that yes, these do appear to be lymph nodes, they're two to, two to three centimeters in size and they had abnormal echo texture. So that is in the internal medicine clinic uh, these days. So because of that, uh, my pager used to go off. Now I just get text messages uh, from the uh, primary care physician asking me to give them a call, and what should we do? Uh, they described this exact uh, a, a similar scenario, and I said, well, my desire would be, uh, is based upon uh, the physical exam that this is an accessible lymph node and that I would refer this patient to one of my surgical colleagues for an excisional biopsy uh, given the location on exam. Um, why did they assume it was lymphoma? Well, it was lymph nodes. They could have called a, a different doctor and maybe got a different answer for a type of biopsy, but because I am a lymphoma doctor by training, uh, I thought that an excisional biopsy would be reasonable given the location. So the surgeon did see them. Uh, they underwent an excisional biopsy, actually not necessarily of a right axillary lymph node, but on physical exam, there was also inguinal lymph nodes. So I gave them the option, and, and often the surgeons will choose the inguinal lymph node over the axilla. Then the pager goes off a second time. The patient has the procedure completed. 
uh, you get a text message from the pathologist, can you give me a call? So that, that same patient, their excisional biopsy came back uh, demonstrating large atypical lymphocytes with effacement of the lymph node architecture. That's all I have. I have an h and &E. I'll get you the rest of the uh, material, but I wanted to get this patient plugged in. Uh, and so we're very, uh, tried to be compliant with our time from acknowledgement of a patient with lymphoma to getting them in very quickly uh, um, into our clinics. And so the initial diagnosis, when I see the PATH report come back, even before I'm getting uh, uh, the patient scheduled, is a diagnosis of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, not otherwise specified. And that's often the first page uh, that gets you into their clinic, but really it's the C-comment part that I think is often most important nowadays in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And that's because it tells you what you also need to be thinking about as you try to plan for this patient. So here's the immunophenotyping uh, of this patient, and I put the reds in, uh, in positive. Uh, so they were CD20 positive, they were CD10 positive, which by default in the Hans criteria automatically makes them a GCB phenotype. But importantly, this patient expressed BCL2, their ki 67 was 70%, and they did have MYC expression. So uh, if you look at this, um, different pathology labs may use different cutoffs, but uh, for the sake of, of this, anything greater than 40% uh, would be considered uh, MYC expressing. Um, they did do some other, other markers uh, via flow cytometry confirming uh, a CD10 positive, CD19 positive B cell disorder. So already right now I'm thinking, okay, this patient has diffuse large B cell lymphoma, but the caveats are is that they're BCL2 expressing and they expect MI express MYC. So I know I'm going to have to do an essential workup in this patient, and we may, for, to uh, expedite the patient, we may ask them uh, to get labs <laughs> as they're approaching uh, the cancer center, and um, we are already working on, because PET, PET CTs now are a, a, a hot tool to get into your patients, and so trying to get them plugged in uh, to the PET CT scanner uh, um, is important, um, and they may get a PET scan before they even see me, because um, I want to be calculating their IPI. So on the door, their CBC is unremarkable, their CMP is unremarkable, their LDH uh, was elevated, when after I saw them and evaluated them, their PF performance status was zero. The PET-CT did demonstrate avid lymph nodes above and below the diaphragm. There were no uh, extranodal sites of disease, and there were no bone lesions. So based upon this, uh, uh, entering the door, the patient has an IPI score of three with her age characteristics for age greater than 60. Her LDH was uh, abnormal, and her stage was stage three. So we're done, right? Not exactly, at least. I think that this is where the pathologist will sign out a PATH report once, but they may sign out the PATH report a second time. And so based upon the fact that the patient had BCL2 expression as well as MYC expression, I think that this is where uh, FISH would be uh, uh, necessary to identify whether or not this patient has now what is called high-grade B-cell lymphoma, and you will see this, uh, otherwise what was called double hit or triple hit. In this case, the patient did not have uh, a double hit or a triple hit lymphoma, but they did have a uh, aberrant uh, translocation in 1418. And so while the PATH report remained unchanged, that the patient did have uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma not otherwise specified, and it did appear by Hans criteria to be a GCB subtype because of the CD10 expression, I do think that this is an important uh, thing to, uh, uh, to call out because their, uh, their induction therapy, in my mind, may have changed had this patient had a high-grade B-cell lymphoma with a double or a triple hit uh, biology. So just a snapshot about uh, a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. As uh, commented by Dr. Leonard, it is the most common non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It accounts for approximately a quarter of all new cases of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. That equates to about 18,000 cases being anticipated in 2000, uh, last year and, and likely moving into this year. These are typically an aggressive uh, lymphoma that presents with rapidly enlarging lymphadenopathy and can present with constitutional symptoms like uh, fevers, uh, drenching night sweats, like somebody poured a bucket of water over your head, and unintentional uh, weight loss, which is often hidden in intentional weight loss. Uh, people start to feel well, they think they're overweight, uh, and they try to lose weight, but they just lose weight, and once they get to their weight, they can't stop losing it. Uh, there's a high frequency of extranodal uh, disease, and so PET-CTs can call that out. 
Um, I would pay attention to those extranodal sites of disease because if you get treated and they don't go away, it may not have always been lymphoma. Uh, patients can have two things going on at once. But I'm trying to get at the point here that in this patient, once I see a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma uh, diagnosis, I am trying to get in, them into my clinic as quickly as possible. I think if you look at the randomized studies that have done a really good job, the most recent one that I can, that can comment on is a CLGB50303 study, which in that arm of diffuse, uh, of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patients who got either R-CHOP or dose-adjusted EPOC-R, the trial did a great job. I think it was 17 days in one arm to get to treatment and 21 days in the other. So really, we're trying to get these pe people treated within weeks of their diagnosis, if not days, to avoid uh, complications of the tumor, potential tumor bulk and tumor aggressiveness. This is a layered pie, I call this, design of the spectrum of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma subtypes. I made the comment on uh, GCB and non-GCB. So I often think that when I see GCB or non-GCB in a PATH report, that means that it was based solely on uh, immunohistochemistry uh, a pathologic analysis. If they do throw in ABC, it means that they went beyond that likely into a nanostring uh, technology. So that's where appropriately a patient could be called ABC is if that uh, um, a, a technology that goes beyond IHC uh, was performed. Embedded on top of that GCB, non-GCB subtyping, therein lies the high-grade B-cell lymphoma. So those are those patients that have a MYC alteration, must have a MYC alteration, plus e either BCL2 or BCL6 aberrations. And so those now in the, uh, the WHO classification would be considered a high-grade B-cell lymphoma. And I think this is important as I start to venture into some of the abstracts at ASH because these are called out differently. They're not often uh, characterized as double hits or triple hits uh, in the patient demographics. So just looking at that when you look at those uh, abstracts. Also that you'll see in there is those patients who are considered double expressors or double expressing lymphomas. So these are patients who will also have a BCL2, uh, um, uh, BCL6, uh, MYC expression um, by IHC, but will not harbor the aberrations on fish or on karyotype. So where does Martha fit in this? Well, she's a GCB phenotype, but she is considered a double expressing lymphoma. And those in the literature, these appear to do less well than if you were not double expressing, but just not as bad potentially as if you were a high grade B cell lymphoma with, or a double or a triple hit. So as I talk, uh, would talk with her about the treatment landscape of diffuse large B cell lymphoma, I would explain to her and her family that this is a curative intense situation. I do not see anything in her past medical history uh, and assuming her echo uh, was uh, normal, I think that I would approach this situation with curative intent. I would discuss that the majority of the patients, and that being 60% of the patients, are often cured, even though she has a high intermediate IPI score. We would need to be careful for and watch for signs of relapse refractory disease. And often, you know, you see patients who are treated initially, their tumors uh, all resolve within one to two cycles of therapy. Uh, they're riding the roller coaster well. It's the fourth and the fifth cycle where you, I think you start to see potentially these inflections and your physical exam skills and how the patient is doing because they are starting to get cumulative toxicity from their induction therapy really matters because you're looking for that, what is roughly, I would say, a 10 to 15% trying to find those primary progressive or primary refractory patients uh, to induction. Because at that point, it becomes very important uh, because if they are re a refractory patient population, you need to move to other discussions very quickly. In those 40% of patients that do have relapse or refractory disease, um, you can consider second line therapy. And if chemo sensitive, move to, towards an autologous stem cell transplant. And if chemo resistant, potentially moving to a commercial CAR T. So in this, uh, in this uh, case scenario, uh, because the patient did not have a high-grade B-cell lymphoma, and based upon the CLGB50303 data, I would discuss uh, RCHOP given every 21 days uh, as a fairly uh, a standard of care, at least in, in North America. Alternative regimens that could be considered uh, would be dose-adjusted EPOC-R. I think I would consider this regimen, and if she were to have had a high-grade B-cell lymphoma, I will make the caveat that I do uh, intend to dose-adjust patients when I give uh, EPOC-R. Um, I'm not sure that you get the same outcomes if you don't have the intent uh, to dose-adjust uh, with EPOC-R. 
our top 14 um, has been, uh, shown, I think, at least equivalent. And when, during my training, somebody told me before the results were known, the reason to give our top 14 was be, to get your hair back faster. Huh. Uh, um, and I think that the data actually uh, bore out uh, with that. In special populations, anthracycline sparing regimens can be given for those patients who have uh, a poor EF. Um, in age greater than 80 with comor uh, other comorbidities, you may substitute uh, uh, liposomal doxorubicin for uh, uh, doxorubicin or give uh, mini RCHOP-like regimens. The lenalidomide maintenance question, I, I think, uh, is an interesting one in patients 60 to 80 of, uh, years of age as kind of a maintenance fashion after RCHOP. So the patient uh, going through her case, uh, she returns uh, uh, post R chop, which she tolerates uh, well without significant issues. But at the end of her treatment, PET CT, uh, she ha achieves a Doville 5. Now, what is that Doville 5? Well, uh, she has a new lesion at the left supraclavicular region, so this was not a site that was involved uh, with the disease. It was an SUV of 18, not the squirrely kind of three to four SUVs, just a hint above liver. This was a new site with a high SUV. And interestingly, she had scattered bone, uh, bone avidity, but no uh, cortical destruction on the CT portion of her PET CT. So disappointing uh, um, visit. And so we discuss about what we need to do. This is a situation where I would go and get a, uh, a second biopsy to confirm that this is truly refractory disease because it is a new site of disease and it is accessible. And so that was done. This time I would consider doing a core needle biopsy uh, um, because we had an established uh, a diagnosis. An excisional biopsy I think would also be a, a reasonable here. The biopsy did confirm diffuse large B-cell lymphoma not otherwise specified. Because I felt she was a transplant uh, candidate, at least going in and at the end of therapy, I did go ahead and do a bone marrow biopsy just because a negative bone marrow means I can move quickly, quicker if I was gonna go towards transplant. The bone marrow biopsy, to our surprise, showed paratubecular CD10 positive small lymphocytes consistent with involvement of follicular lymphoma, kind of going back to that she had an aberrant uh, T1418 at diagnosis of her large cell lymphoma. So there may have been an antecedent indolent lymphoma component uh, to her uh, lymphoma. So now we have to start talking about second line therapy and I think that this is true is that uh, um, there are those patients that you would consider and you have to judge before starting second line therapy if they would be a transplant candidate versus those who are non-transplant candidates. In this case, I would have considered her a transplant candidate and I would have offered her uh, off of a clinical trial, ICE, DHAP, or GDP, or there's other institutional uh, favorites uh, that can be listed in the uh, NCCN uh, guidelines from that standpoint, but I would really scour and look for if there's clinical trials because this is a primary refractory patient, and I understand that this patient is already by definition chemorefractory. Had she been deemed not a transplant candidate, I think that gem, uh, gemcitabine oxidoplatinum is interestingly positioned in the NCCN guidelines as both being an acceptable regimen for bridging to transplant, while it's not commonly used, but also lives in the non-transplant uh, candidate uh, uh, status. Brentuximab adotin for those patients who are CD30 positive, abrutinib, uh, ideally in non-GCB disease, as well as lenalidomide plus or minus rituximab. And I call that out because it has historically been uh, thought in ABC, but I think there's been emerging data looking at transformed follicular uh, patients as well as patients with GCB that they may have act activity also uh, in the GCB subtype. So this patient isn't quite, at least in the United States, uh, could not get a CAR T-cell therapy commercially because she's only received one line of therapy. You have, have to have received at least two lines of therapy or greater to get uh, towards a commercial uh, um, AXI cell or T-cytogenic leucyl uh, trial. And uh, again, uh, lysocaptogene uh, uh, marileucyl is, is not approved uh, in this setting either. So in my mind, in this visit, I try to think very hard on how I'm going to have this discussion because I, you often know the PET scan before you walk in the room. But you want to uh, make sure that you convey that primary refractory disease is a concerning thing uh, and that her prognosis uh, changed drastically uh, with this finding. And, I, and trying to convey that without scaring them out of the room or their family out of the room is incredibly important, but getting across that the importance of what we do next uh, is, uh, is paramount. 
And that comes from, I think, using the Scholar 1 data, and you can't uh, often go talk about CAR T cell without a prelude with the Scholar 1 data, which looked at uh, either retrospective uh, case series or as patients who were in prospective uh, uh, series and gathered 636 patients. Uh, again, who had primary refractory disease, who were refractory to second-line therapy or later, or who had <coughs> relapsed within 12 months of an autologous transplant. And you can see the curves here. You could dive into this curve and not hit the bottom. These are bad curves. You can see here the median survival in a primary refractory patient was 7.1 months versus 6.1 months if you're refractory to second-line therapy, and 6.2 months if you relapsed within 12 months of therapy. So relapse refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is a bad disease. And I often say that, you know, uh, you don't know in, out in, when you're not seeing lymphoma each day what the patient before or the patient after this patient was. And so to un get to understand that relapse refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma is kind of the next line of therapy does matter and how you plan forward is critically important. Because whatever you choose next, at least in this series, the overall response rate was 26% you had a 7% chance of getting a complete remission. Granted, this is CT-based uh, CT responses. However, if you look at those overall survival curves, those patients, if they did get a response, they were often not durable. And so this is a point where I start, uh, if, I, if I can, uh, to try to go to the discussion of the currently enrolling head-to-head uh, -head trials of CAR T-cell versus autotransplant, whether that be the Belinda trial and having similar endpoints, or Zuma 7, or Transform. And if I'm not, if, if this was a center that didn't have these trials available, I would start to look on clinicaltrials.gov looking for uh, whether or not uh, uh, there was a trial center close by, um, and then asking the, the patient and their family, do they have the resources to potentially travel. So really it becomes, is there a role for CAR T-cell therapy? So Martha uh, did uh, consider enrolling into a CAR T-cell versus auto trial, but was unable to uh, continue due to insurance constraints, and I think that this is a reality. Uh, there's eligibility constraints, but then the ability to get the transplant at the location uh, where you're doing the trial is, is, is important also. So there's a lot of uh, the machinery done with these trials that patients that want to go on them may not be able to get onto them. So unfortunately, uh, uh, the, the patient received our, our ICE as second, li our, uh, second line therapy. Uh, completed appropriate number of cycles, and again had a Dovil 5 with residual AVID sites three times greater than liver. So again, kind of speaking to what Dovil 5 is, it can be a new lesion, but it can also be those uh, residual lesions that really haven't necessarily changed in size and didn't have any significant uh, change or delta in their SUVs. So at that time point, an autologous stem cell transplant was deferred because she was, again, double refractory, but she fortunately remained relatively asymptomatic from her disease burden. So as this patient was moved towards insurance approval for commercial CAR T cell because there was no uh, <coughs> clinical trials that were felt to be appropriate or available. So the clock starts. And I think it's important to think about what the clock starts because I think there are two, uh, uh, there's the clinical trial clock, which we're going to talk about for CAR T cells, but then there's also, in my mind, what I call the brain to vein. So the time when you think that you want to do the CAR T cell to the time that you actually get the patient aphorist. Because that time, that starts with working on insurance approval, and once getting insurance approval, uh, you have to then often, in many centers, you're working off of a, negotiating a single case agreement. And so this is the true denominator of these patients, I think. What is the vein-to-vein -vein time? Now that's when you get the patient aphorist, you get the T cells manufactured and sent back to you, and then reinfused. That's pretty well set uh, in the CAR T cell commercial world, but what is the true denominator in CAR T cell? I think it truly is the brain-to-vein time, then the vein-to-vein -vein time. So how many patients can you actually get CAR T cells in when you incorporate both of these uh, time frames? And I don't know that that is well captured in the data quite yet, but I'm, I know that people are starting to think about uh, this brain-to-vein time is incredibly important and in areas to improve upon. So I thought about all the CAR T-cell studies, and my, I was starting to go blind uh, reading off my phone uh, when I typed in Chimeric uh, to, to search all of the abstracts that are at ASH. There's an explosion. If you type CAR T-cell into the title, it probably gets accepted uh, 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 at, at ASH. I, I thought about this yesterday. If I had to There's sort a dummy, mistake, a dummy a dummy <laughs> abstract, right, put CAR T-cell in it, would it have, by publication only, I don't know. Uh, I didn't do that. 
Um, but so, so where is CAR T? So I think there's so much data in CAR T cell at, at ASH that rather than, I, know I called out a couple of uh, abstracts, but rather than go through them all, I just chose really uh, to highlight what we know right now and sprinkle in a little bit of abstracts going along the way. So not all CAR T cell constructs are the same. The cell dose is not the same. The patient populations that were studied in these pivotal studies of Zuma 1, Juliet, and Transcend, um, uh, how many patients had actually gotten to a, an auto uh, were not the same. Whether or not you can do bridging therapy was not the same. So I'm going to go through each one of these uh, briefly uh, and for time's sake fairly quickly because uh, I do want to get to questions. So in Zuma 1, uh, they had a DLBCL cohort as well as a primary metastinal and transformed follicular cohort. I think the important thing on this slide is that 99% of the patients were enrolled, were successfully manufactured, and 91% of them were dosed. This is a study where you could not get bridging. Bridging, I think, did allow steroids, but this is a heavily refractory patient population. You were still able to get them aphed to, and, and to their infusion. Um, looking at here, I think uh, when I see CAR T cell studies, I don't necessarily pay attention to the overall sponsor rate. I look at the CR rates, and here a 54% uh, uh, CR rate at a median follow-up uh, and a, <coughs> at, at 15.4 months showed an, a CR rate of 40%. So higher CAR T cell levels were associated with response, and overall rates of survival 18 months was 52%. So quite impressive uh, in this refractory large cell patient population. What also is equally impressive is the duration of response. So in, uh, achieving a CR post CAR T is incredibly important. And I think in longer follow-up, you can see here at two-year uh, two follow-up, those sensor marks uh, are beyond uh, 24 months and a CR rate of 54%. And I think importantly, as we start to think about, and as you see the ASH abstracts that are reporting response rates at day 29, really it's more likely the day, uh, day 90 to six months response rates that may be surrogates for long-term durable remissions. But people have said that this is the tail to the curve that is wagging very nicely. So then you go in from the Zuma 1 data, that's clinical trials, now take the gloves off and you go into the real world experience and looking at uh, real world data from 17 centers who used Axi cells as a commercial product. You can see here 43% of the patients would not have been eligible for uh, the Zuma 1 clinical trial and I think that that's important to, to call out. Um, but if you look at the uh, CR rates or the best CR rates, it was kind of scary how similar it was between Zuma 1, it was 58% and 57% in the real world experience, as well as the uh, adverse events of cytokine release syndrome and neurologic events were quite similar. This data continues to mature and was very uh, immature uh, last year at, at ASH. So looking at some ASH uh, AxiCell and uh, Lysa, uh, uh, t cytogenic glucil up updates. So uh, they went back and looked at the two-year outcomes of Zuma 1 to Scholar 1, and AxiCell resulted in 11.5-fold higher odds of achieving a CR compared to Scholar 1. And the two-year survival was 50% in Zuma 1 compared to 12% in Scholar 1, translating to a 73% reduction in the risk of death in Zuma 1 compared to Scholar 1, with all the caveats of what Scholar 1 is. Um, looking at the real-world evidence on CAR T-cell therapy, so this is looking at eight <coughs> academic centers uh, that had uh, both used Axi cell and t glucil, and here you can see day 90 CR rates of 39% for both constructs. So Juliet trial was a phase two global trial. Here's the eligibility. 93 patients were treated. Uh, the CR rate was 40%. 65% were, were relapse free at 12 months. Of them, 79% of them uh, were patients with a complete remission. Again, kind of the same curves. Those patients who achieve a CR appear to have the best durability, and it kind of bears out in overall survival. This is an update uh, um, from the CIBMTR registry, which the patients who commercially were treated with TCG glucil entered into. Um, looking at uh, cell dose viability going uh, prior to infusion. So those patients who had greater than 80% viability appeared to do uh, uh, just as well as those patients who had viability from 60 to 80%. So that would be considered an out-of-spec product uh, um, uh, from that standpoint. And I think that that is something, if you look across the, the CR rates of 39 and 38% with small numbers, something of interest. Uh, to think about uh, coming out in the real-world experience uh, from uh, with TCG and Leclusal. 
So speaking to the third, uh, which is uh, uh, lysocaptogene marilusal or JCAR-17 or lysocell, uh, this is a fixed dose of, uh, of four, uh, CD4s and CD8s, which are manufactured separately and then re-infused uh, separately as CAR T cells. Uh, this is the phase one transcend study uh, with uh, um, looking at multiple dose levels, uh, single dose or dose level one, double dose, and those uh, who receive dose level two. Um, for the sake of time, uh, the full cohort included other subtypes, uh, included ECOG2, whereas the core was uh, drilled down into certain diffuse large B-cell lymphoma subtypes uh, moving forward, and so I had less number of patients. I think what to call out here is, again, the similarities in uh, three-month and, and six-month CR rates to other, uh, potentially other constructs. Again, not noting uh, differences in dose, uh, dose levels uh, being used here in different patient populations. Again, similar uh, outcomes. So the, those patients in CRs appear to be uh, those who uh, were obtaining the best uh, durability uh, with a median follow of, of, of 12 months. Again, regardless of the full or the core subsets, CRs continued to do uh, fairly well from an overall survival standpoint with it not being, median not being reached. So to highlight some further abstracts, there's health-related quality outcomes, uh, um, looking at patients who received uh, uh, JCAR-17 or lys uh, lysocell on the Transcend study, showing that while those patients felt their CAR T-cell one month and those people who got into remission, their quality of life outcomes did improve at six and 12 months. So there is life after CAR T-cell from a quality of life standpoint if you can get those patients into a remission. And also the pivotal uh, data uh, from the Transcend um, 001 study with an overall response rate, at least what's reported, 73% with a CR rate of 53% with the median PFS at 6.8 months and median OS at 9.9 .9 months and the duration of mission in those patients in CR had not been reached, similar to the other constructs. So Martha proceeded on to commercial CAR T cells. She receives a lymphodepleting psi flu. She did have uh, uh, CRS at day plus four manifested by fevers and hypotension. The hypotension was re uh, responsive to IV fluids and was treated as if she had grade two CRS. You can see here across the board uh, the uh, CRS spectrum for Zuma 1, Julia, and Transcend. 93% uh, in Zuma 1, Julia at 58% in Transcend. 37%, uh, and you can see here the neurotoxicity, 65, 21, and 23. Different criteria potentially uh, um, for CRS, but neurotoxicity was similar. Just uh, quickly uh, in my last few slides here, uh, to note that the, the uh, uh, CRS as well as uh, neurotoxicity grading scale has evolved. Now fever is a hallmark of, of CRS. You must have fever initially in order to be called CRS. Often these patients are neutropenic when they have CRS, so they're often CRSing and having neutropenic fever that you're, that you're treating for uh, here. And really it's been simplified to vasopressors and def better defining uh, the hypoxia definitions for CRS. Also within the neurotoxicity or what now is called ICANS, the MMSE is being phased out and the I score, which came from a pediatric uh, um, scoring system has been phased <coughs> in and level of consciousness is uh, uh, now being factored in as well as seizures, motor findings, and, and evidence of inter elevated intracranial pressure or cerebral edema. So this is uh, the NCCN um, uh, recommendations on CRS management. There will be, uh, I'm sure, multiple different uh, management uh, strategies and some institutional-based uh, strategies on how to uh, manage CRS and as well as neurotoxicity. So uh, in summary, CD19 CAR T cells induce durable remissions around 40%. It seems like the constructs are fairly similar in that. Um, CRS and neurotoxicity are major toxicities. They are the things that I think the most about uh, uh, when I'm on the inpatient service. Uh, often in CAR T cell patients are there um, and how to treat them, uh, but are felt to be generally reversible. So what to look for? I think there's promising data uh, emerging in, in CLL. All right, great, thank nice. you. Uh, so a couple of questions, and I'll start uh, with Nathan around infectious prophylaxis in patients with follicular lymphoma. Um, what do you do if someone's on bendamustine? What do you do if someone's on a PI3 kinase inhibitor as far as infection prophylaxis, um, as well as maybe the anticoagulation with, uh, with lenalidomide? Yeah, so I think uh, 
real quick so with lenalidomide. I, uh, if you look at the myeloma literature, aspirin works actually pretty good as, uh, as a prophylaxis. So most of my patients, I just have them start uh, low-dose aspirin when they start lenalidomide. And patients, at least in the, in the, I don't know if we really published a lot about this, but in the phase two trials, uh, we saw that the risk of a clot kind of correlated with uh, patients' bulk of disease. Some patients that have uh, really bulky, especially bulky abdominal disease, all usually start Lovenox for the first two cycles and then transition to aspirin uh, once they kind of start to reduce a little bit. Uh, so everyone should get aspirin. High-risk patients, I give them lenalidomide in the, in the initial cycles until the disease comes under control. But vendamustine, as you mentioned, you know, there are several of these uh, studies that have suggested that patients can be at risk for opportunistic infections up to nine months after they finish bendamustine. This is probably from suppression of T-cell uh, counts that can occur quite long after uh, fludarabine and bendamustine. And so I generally prophylax with, uh, you know, things for viruses. Uh, sometimes I, I really don't do much Bactrim, but Valtrex uh, and some patients. But I don't know what you, uh, you guys' thoughts are on bendamustine prophylaxis. I think it's kind of all over the board. I've seen some mm -hmm. people don't do it at all, and uh, some I, people, yeah. I, I usually don't give them quinolone. I give them septrin, and I just base that on my experience with fludarabine cyclophosphamide. I kind of think of uh, bender as sort of a, a dose light FC, and, and, and in the, in the benetuzumab study you were talking about, those are some of the late toxicities that were seen. It was the bendamustine arm where, where the issues were. So I, I give Bactrim for at least six months post-treatment, and I, if the CD4 count's really low, I might just keep it going as well. Yeah, I, th I think a cycle of error is important uh, from a from a zoster standpoint, um, because I think I've seen that I don't usually use a cycle for prophylaxis for our chop, but I do for for bendamustine uh, based regimen. I think the the Bactrim use, you know, kind of is all over the place. Sometimes I look at ALCs like you're talking about, or or just kind of what their exposure has been and mm -hmm. how they tolerated it. So Simon, questions on what percentage of patients with mantle cell uh, have p53 mutations, and this may differ at diagnosis and relapse. What's your sense of that to define the problem? And also uh, another question on uh, ERAC, the, the uh, bendamustine rituximab ERAC regimen and the use of that in older patients. Um, so so p53 mutations, about six to eight percent of all patients. Um, as I say, I only, I only measure it in young patients, so it's rare. It's, and you can usually pick who those patients are. They're not, they're not always the blastoid patients, although that it's enriched. So the sort of the very prolific patient with the blastoid phenotype is is likely to be 50, p53 mutated. And before we knew that p53 data, those patients I, were, I was allografting up front. Anyway, the back data. Well, I mean, I just really like that regimen, and I've just used it more and more and more. And as you get a feel for it, um, you, can, you can really play with the doses of the drugs, particularly in older, frailer patients. Uh, so I'm talking exclusively in the post-BTK space now, and, and again, ignore anecdotes. However, I treated a guy who's 82 who had blastoid relapse. Uh, he only lasted three months on, on a brutinib. I gave him one dose of Bender at 70, one dose of Cytarabin, flat dose 500. Uh, with rituximab, did that every, I think every two or three weeks, depending on what his counts were. He went to a CR. So you can, you can dose reduce the cytarabine particularly from three days down to two days or even one day. So, uh, because it's quite toxic, particularly if you've been heavily pretreated in older patients. But it's, it's a really nice combination of drugs. But it's, it's more cytopenic than you think it is, so you just be quite cautious. Okay. So, Matt, could you comment on bispecific antibodies? A lot of uh, data there. We have, I believe, a plenary talk on bispecific uh, agent. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's exciting. I mean, we knew blenitumumab was in the NHL space, um, and I think it still may be in clinical trials, but the plenary, I think, is, I'm trying to say the name, Mosunatuzumab, I think it is, <laughs> yeah. uh, um, you know, is the, is the plenary session. And I think it... You know, the, it, the, the outcome or the, how the results were is in the title. Um, you know, heavily pretreated post-CAR T-cell, you know, uh, patient uh, population. I think that that's really, you know, an interesting place to go uh, is those refractory uh, um, to CAR T-cell therapy patients. I think it's going to be interesting to see what the durability is going to be uh, with those uh, with those antibody drug conjugates, I, uh, sorry, not antibody drug, uh, the bispecifics. 
um, and what their toxicity profile is going to be. Um, I think it's been nice because I do run on the ALL service, so I do still get exposure to um, the bite toxicities or, or potentially lack thereof and their ability to be in and out of the hospital you know, if they have no infusional uh, uh, complications. So I really think it's going to come down to durability and positioning. Um, uh, and then the, what the brain to vein time is really short. The brain to vein time is very short uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there, assuming you ask uh, for approval. Um, you know, if they get an approval in and, and, and our label, yes, sure, sure. that that is true. On the other hand, some of the patients with the worst disease don't get the CAR T cells. So exactly. actually, the, yep. having made it through CAR T cells and relapsing actually makes you not necessarily the least favorable patient. You may have few options, but it's kind of like the patient that lives to get 10 therapies versus the patient that only gets two and progresses through both yeah. of those. I, I agree. There, it seems yeah. to be a split. I think there was an ASCO abstract that looked at the, how many patients actually got treated post-CAR T-cell. The number that comes off the top of my head was half. So half the patients get no further therapy after progression after CAR T-cell, and the other, other do. So you're right, in those potential half, those are the those are patient po uh, patient populations for potentially that therapy, but you know you've already perturbed in one of the escape mechanisms is CD19 you know loss, uh, so I think that's got to be uh, thought about here too. So Nathan, who do you uh, think about uh, auto stem cell transplanted in follicular lymphoma? That wasn't the focus of your talk uh, appropriately, but uh, um, you still must send an occasional patient for an yeah, auto I think transplant. So I'm actually. Um you know, we used to do a lot, a lot of allo transplants and follicular lymphoma based upon some of the data that came from a, my colleague Issa Curry that showed it, the, if you look at the long-term remissions following allo transplant, it's around 85% of patients are probably cured. The problem is that 15% of them die within 18 months. So basically, if you survive your allo, you're cured. Uh, so uh, morning, it's still a very toxic but effective therapy. The auto transplant, so I, occasionally I send allo, but honestly, my practice is almost all follicular. I almost never send to aloe anymore. I do send patients to auto transplant, especially patients that are, as I mentioned, despite the, the, the title of all of our talks, most of these treatments are not going to cure patients. In fact, most of them, if you look at the second or third line, you're going to get remissions that are around a year. So if you've got a young patient and they're in their third line of therapy and they are transplant eligible, I would send them to auto. A lot of the long term data from auto transplant suggests that. About half of your patients may achieve durable, meaning five to 10 year remissions following auto. So third line, mm -hmm. uh, young and uh, transplant, young-ish, young is a moving target. One other question for you, Nathan. Uh, lenalidomide associated diarrhea, any tricks for that? So the great news about, I mean, if there is any great news about diarrhea, <laughs> the, 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 the great news about uh, le, the, the diarrhea from lenalidomide, it appears to be very different than the, the diarrhea that we see with PI3 kinase inhibitors, and many times it responds to just imodium, so, uh, I, or I, kaopectate, or, or, so many times anything over the counter works uh, quite well. Okay. Uh, Matt, you uh, weren't able to get to two scenarios, just re refractory, uh, primary mediastinal disease, what do you do in those patients, and also double and triple hit your frontline therapy? So I think in the, I'll take the second part first. Well, actually, they're both very similar. I, I think that uh, dose-adjusted epoch r would be reasonable uh, considerations for both as upfront up strategies. I think a lot of times you're in the primary mediastinal because of, by definition, it's primary mediastinal. You know, you're trying to uh, potentially spare them for radiotherapy. Um, and I think the, the data, you know, while I don't think that the real world experience may not be as good as the, the single institution experience or, or broader experiences, um, but does suggest that epoch R would be reasonable strategies. I'd come back to this just because I have this internal discussion with colleagues is around the dose adjustment aspect. You know, going back to 1993, I think, was when the first uh, publication was about dose adjustment epoch. You know, the whole premise was about dose adjustment. Mm -hmm. And if you aren't potentially, do you know, thinking about dose adjustment, you could be over-treating a patient, too, because there are dose modifications down as part of that, uh, that regimen, too. And I think if you look in the CLGB study, the median number of dose adjustments in that uh, study was three if you were in the dose adjusted epoch arm. So, you know, patients are getting uh, up there um, and are still tolerating it while the con one of the conclusions was it was more intensive and potentially more toxic, you know, but that was how the trial was designed and how it was written. So I think if you're going to use it and you were quoting the, the abstracts and the, and the manuscripts that support the use in those disease uh, subtypes, 
That's my practice. Okay. Two last questions to Simon as we wrap up. Uh, what do you do with a patient on a brutinib who develops AFib, and do you do PET scans of mantle cell lymphoma? Good question. So the answer is I treat the AFib and keep the abrutinib going. Uh, I must have a dozen patients in that scenario now. Um, and you anticoagulate? Anticoagulate, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do whatever the cardiologist thinks we should do. And uh, mm -hmm. if you stop it, the, the occasional person, uh, the AF will go away. But I, in my experience, that doesn't happen. And I don't care too much about AF. I think it's fascinating. <laughs> Ten years ago, if you got AF on CHOP, nobody gave a damn. Nobody cared about atrial fibrillation at all. All right? And now we're all obsessed with it. Um, what was the second question? PET scans and mantle scans. I, I do, but I don't. Um, <laughs> PET scans don't upstage anybody. They don't see the bowel very well. They don't see the bone marrow very well. So, uh, and be very, very cautious making a treatment decision based on a PET scan after treatment. You don't know what PET positivity means, neither do I. It probably means they're going to do worse, but don't retreat. So I've seen too many patients now who've had treatment X. At the end of treatment X, they've got a weeny little node that's PET positive. They then do treatment Y, at the end of which they've got another node they do it again. So if you see the patient who've had three lots of treatment based on this. You know, only in the world of a PET scan is a, uh, what used to be a PR, good PR, now a bad result. result. Mm -hmm. So be very cautious in how you interpret them, would be my advice. Great. And remember that the best way to do, stay in remission longer is do fewer scans. So <laughs> yeah. That's the cheapest way to improve PFS. Um, very good. All right, great. Well, that brings us to the close of our session. I want to thank all the speakers for a great discussion. Thank the audience for being here and great questions. And hope you have a great uh, rest of the ASH meeting. This activity has been jointly provided by Penn State College of Medicine and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash CQB860. This activity is supported by educational grants from Celgene Corporation and Veristem Oncology.